a couple of things. One, lab five here, don't worry. Uh, I just wanted to provide if you wanted, so if your lab five is not fully working, I haven't yet graded lab five, so I don't know where people are with that, but if your lab five is not fully working, I'm happy to provide you my solution to lab five to use as a starting point for lab six. So if anyone wants that, email me. I'll make a, um, uh, a GitHub repository and I'll share it with you. All right. Same deal as with your own solutions. Don't share the, you know, don't make public repositories out of these and don't share them because we don't want people out on the net who are looking at this to be able to easily find solutions. Office hours today uh, till four in the cafe and then six on in the lab. As I was looking over the homework 14, homework 14 I think was the high level languages, is that right? Anyway, looking over uh, some of the answers to the questions, I just wanted to correct a misconception. So a couple of people came up with the fact that one of the, let me back up, one of the things I appreciated was people said, well, yeah, even if the high level languages made things easier, it'd still maybe make things too easy and we like learning the things that we're having to learn from doing this. Someone um, said, makes you kind of a better programmer if you're more careful. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly the case. Um, maybe it, it actually is the case. So let me make a digression. Um, are you familiar, any of you, with as safety improvements have been made to autos that doesn't, hasn't necessarily reduced incidences of problems because, why? Does anyone know? Well, not quite. It's actually people respond to changes. If it is safer to drive, they can drive faster and maintain the same risk, right? So there's a, and many people don't believe this, right? That just because we have seat belts and airbags and so on, that people in general are driving worse than they otherwise would. But if you th do a thought experiment, Imagine you have on your steering wheel a big spike out like this, okay? Would you drive slower? Or would you drive more carefully? Yes, so. So the same thing is true about programming in C. I think you actually are more careful, but the consequences can be pretty bad sometimes. Okay, in array accesses and things like that, um, what would be an example? An inf schedule. right, where you're having to go through the inv array, and if you go off the end, you might not find about the, Find out about that in C for some time. That's a good example. But back to what I was originally talking about, the misconception. So no memory management. And in one sense, that is true. The metadata things you're allocating in the kernel, you don't have to worry about when you deallocate and so on. But we actually, I think their question came up on that on Wednesday. Like, in JOS, do we have any such allocations or many of those allocations? And in JOS, we actually don't. So memory management does not mean that we don't have to deal with page tables. So we still have to deal with page tables. We still have to do page allocation. of physical pages. We could maybe get around this, but it would be a large overhead for the Go garbage collector in particular. So you're still dealing with this. You're still dealing with switching the page table as you're going into and out of user mode. So, okay, so I just wanted to I'll make that correction. Any questions? All right, so today we're talking about scalable locking. So let's talk about this diagram. So this diagram let's look at multi CPU systems. So if we have a multi CPU system, uh, a 
Desiderata, what do we like? What do we want from it, right? What are our desires? Well, here's one I think we like. More CPUs implies, can we say this? More CPUs implies less time. That is, adding more CPUs makes it go faster. That would be nice, but not necessarily, will not necessarily work, okay? The classic example that's given, if it takes one woman nine months to, to carry a baby to term, nine women can't do it in one month, okay? It's a serial, it's an inherently serial process, okay? So some things can be sped up and some things can't be sped up. Okay. So how about this? More CPUs implies at least it's not more time. That would seem bad, right? We throw more CPUs at the problem and it slows down. Okay? That's what we have in this chart here. Okay? What we're looking at is number of cores across the bottom and some number of operations per millisecond. And we see it starts going up with one CPU and with two CPUs and with three CPUs and it kind of has a small little jump drop at five and six, sorry, at six. But then it goes back up and keeps going up until it gets about nine and then it plateaus, right? Less than or equal to. Wrong, it doesn't plateau. It dives down and becomes awful and worse than with one CPU and it gets worse and worse over time as you add more CPUs. So that's bad, right? You, it's hard to reason about your system if adding more CPUs slows it down. Okay, so there's obviously something going on here. Well, yeah. What's going on around six cores? Yeah, it, there's, it's a, I don't know. <laughs> so, we need locks, right? We have locks basically for, we've got our code, and within our code, we have a subset of our code that needs to run with just one thread, right? With just one core. So, this is a critical section. And this is less than or equal to one thread at a time, right, in here. So for the whole rest of it, we can have as many threads as we want, but in here, we only get one. And how do we make sure we only get one? We have a lock. Lock acquire, lock release. The size of this critical section, with respect to the entire thing that you're running, controls how much speed up you're going to be able to get. So Amdahl, he was an IBM researcher, and then he went and started a competitor to IBM. Um, so Amdahl, his law is, if the serial part of your code is S percent, then the maximum speed up you can get is one over S percent, okay? In the case of carrying a baby, the serial percentage is what? 100 percent. And so the total speed up you can get by throwing more and more uh, cores at the problem <laughs> is one over 100 percent, which is one, which is you don't get any speed up. This is percent of the total amount of work to be done, right? If we looked and said, if we run this with one CPU and it takes 10 seconds, and the part that we have a lock around takes a half a second, then our serial percentage is, so let's put the numbers here. All right, so this is one half a second, and this is 10 seconds then our serial percentage is 5%. And therefore, our maximum speed up 
equals 20, right? 1 over 0 0.05. So 48 cores, we're not going to be able to take advantage of. And basically what will happen is, if we throw 48 cores at this, what's going to kind of be happening during this lock? If any one particular core goes in and gets to here to acquire the lock, what is it almost certainly going to find? It's already taken, and it's going to have to wait in line. And then when it gets its chance, it'll run this. And then when it's done, it'll have to release one of the guys. You had a question, Drew? That's right. Because yes, exactly. Because a lock enforces only one thread, only one core can be executing this at a time. So therefore, that forces it to be serial. Okay? Because the reason for the lock is to prevent the parallelism. Right. Okay. So Let's look at what a scalable lock would look like. We would like to have something that looks more like and I'm okay if we're not going up as long as we're not going down. So we want something that looks, you know, kind of like that. That's our goal. Make sense? And so first we need to figure out what's going on. So we've got these CPUs. They're communicating with a bus, right, to RAM. And if we think of the exchange um, opcode, which you remember just exchanges two values and returns you the old value, right? So we can use that as kind of a test and set. So in theory, what, ha what, it, what, what we can look at at an abstract level is it's going ahead and sending it out Right, an address on the bus, getting its result, so doing a, basically a read of it, and then doing a write of it with the value you're trying to exchange. And during the entire time, locking the bus to make sure no one comes in in the middle. So it's basically a read and a write of a memory address that are atomic. Yes? There's no communication necessary. We just go out on the bus, right? We just need to make sure that there's some common way we're using to get to RAM so that we can stop any other processes, any other processors from going to RAM while we're doing our read and write. And Not at the same time, but normally you make one request, and then the next request can go along, and the next request can go along. And here it's doing two requests in a row, and ensuring that nothing can happen in, the, in between. Does that make sense? OK. So that's not how it really works, though. Because that would mean we have to go to RAM every time we want to be doing an exchange operation. I mean, in general, let's, let's forget about the exchange operation. Just in general, when you're reading and writing meaning addresses, you don't want to be going actually to RAM every time. How, what's the cost of this approximately? How many nanoseconds to get to RAM? Yeah, about 100 is a, is a reasonable number. So 100 is unfortunately much slower than a CPU operation, which is around, yeah, around around one or a couple, right? If we're, yeah, so. So what do we do instead? We've got these cache, caches, one cache per CPU. And I suppose we should really fix something about this, which is we do not have four copies of CPU zero. We actually have four different CPUs, <laughs> okay. So we've got caches on each of these, and we need to ensure that sort of everything works right with those caches. The two problems we can have are consistency, making sure that when we read and write memory locations, that the order in which those happens 
is, is sort of maintained. And also, if you've got multiple CPUs that are reading and writing a single memory location, that there's an agreement of what the current value of it is. Drew. Is this a cache per CPU? Not yet. Let's, here's a cache per CPU. And we'll just use those same green numbers, which is nice, for one, two, and three, because we still have four CPUs. So now we need to figure out how do we do a lock. Because we might have memory cached in here. So forget even about exchanges. How do we do writes? How do we do reads, given the fact that we have caches? Okay. If this were read-only memory, okay, this would be easy. right? We just Each of these can cache to its heart's content what it wants. The problem is when we throw writing in there. Because if this guy wants to write this cache, then we've got a problem. Even if it goes ahead and doesn't just write to the cache. So we could have maybe a write-through cache. A write-through cache says, when you do a write, you update the cache, and you write to whatever you are caching, that backing store. A write-back cache is different. A write-back cache says, write to the cache, and at some point, make sure it gets updated later. But even if you had a write-through cache, we have a problem. Because if this guy is trying to read address 1234, sorry, this guy's writing address 1234, this guy has previously read 1234, where's its value of 1234? Stuck in this cache. It's been updated, it doesn't know about it, that's a problem. So we need to have some way of invalidating caches. Which is where we get to, for whoever asked about that, communicating between CPUs, why we have to have that inner CPU communication. That's, that's true. I still think not having in full screen mode is worth a try. Not full screen mode. I've never seen a malfunction when it's not in full screen mode. Yeah, that's because we almost never have been not in yeah, full so screen. No, but, no, yeah. but, yes. You've also never seen it fail when I'm wearing a bathing suit, but I don't think that would have any effect. <laughs> okay, so. There's lots of work over the years in terms of how to have this cache coherence, how to ensure for multiple CPUs. So here's what we're going to do. This is one particular approach. And this is what is used, I believe, by both Intel and AMD. All right, so we're going to have our cache, right? And our cache is going to be a collection of cache lines, where each cache line we have 64 bytes. Okay, so we basically have an ad address and we have our cached 64 bytes for that. And we're going to keep track of this cache being in one of this cache line being in one of three states, and this is on a given CPU, right? So, so this is for CPU I. It can be invalid. We know what that means, right? There's nothing at that ca at at that address, right? So this is available to be used for caching other things. It can be modified. So modified means this has basically been changed. Let's go ahead and put this back. This one will be invalid. So this one is don't care. Right? This one is modified. And this is the latest copy of this data. Right? So this latest copy does not exist in memory that is in the RAM and does not exist on any other cache. It's here. So this is like the dirty bit? It's exactly like the dirty bit. Yeah. 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 
And then our final one is shared. So shared says this is the latest copy and it equals RAM. And this does not necessarily equal RAM, right? If you rewrite the same value, then, well, it could even be smart enough, I guess, to realize it hasn't really changed. But in general, this is a latest copy that was done because of a write. So we did a write. It hasn't yet gone back to the RAM, and so it's modified. Here, basically, we did a read. We did a read, and we have the latest copy that's in RAM. We can't have on a single cache the same cache line in more than one of three states, right? So this is not actually possible on a single CPU, right? I just wanted to show you the different values. And then there's the ability to invalidate a cache, a cache line. Okay, so one CPU can say to another CPU, invalidate this from your cache line. Or we can find, say, does anyone have this address? So let's look at how we move among these. Does this make sense right now? Kind of roughly? Let's look at our two CPU system, CPU zero and CPU one. So if I've got address 1234, and I've got my data, and I am in S mode, can I have on my other CPU this in S mode as well? Yep. Yeah. And that would happen if this one read 1234. It would come up from RAM, right? And it would get one, two, three, four, and it's get its value. And then the same thing over here, and they'd have the same value. And as each one tried to re read from one, two, three, four, second and subsequent times, it'd be much quicker, right? It'd be, what, on the order of sub, sub 10 nanosecond, okay, to read from this cache line. Now, if this guy writes, so this says hello. And this guy writes goodbye. That'll put this in the M state. What else needs to happen to this guy? Needs to be yeah, got to be invalidated because this is the latest version. You no longer have the latest version. We need to invalidate not only on this CPU but on all CPUs. So let's look at an example. Well, let's look at the simplest example. We have nothing there. It's invalid. If we do a read, what do we need to do? Why are we doing the find? Oh yeah, we, are, we have to do the find for, for a moment. So on a read, we can read from main memory and set it to shared. There's a potential problem. If you have that cache line modified and I go to read from memory, I won't get the latest version. So I need to first give you a chance to, fix, to update it. So I'm going to tell you, find. And how I find you is another question. Let's say for now I'm just broadcasting to everyone. Hey, everyone in here, all of you cores, one, two, three, four, if you've got it, write it out to memory. And don't mark it as modified anymore, yes. How do you know who's the most there, And that's a key. Only one of you gets to have a modified at once. We're gonna, that's, that's really important. If we try to write to something that's shared, then shared means any of the other cores could have this in their cache line. And so therefore, if I'm going to write it, I'm going to make mine be modified, and I need to tell all the rest of you, you guys are no longer valid. So I'm going to tell all of you, you are invalid. OK? And Deacon. First, have to read um, because otherwise, like, 
In order to write, you do not have to first read. Yeah, what'll happen, yes. So if we write, we're gonna, so we're in this mode and I do a write. Sorry, I'm in invalid mode now, I'm not in shared mode, right? I'm in invalid mode. I don't have it at all. I just know I wanna write to one, two, three, four. What I say basically is, I don't care whether you guys all have one, two, three, four shared or whether one of you has one, two, three, four modified. But I'm overwriting it. So you throw yours away, actually invalidate, yeah, just invalidate, throw yours away, mine is better, I win. <laughs> but writes are typically smaller than a full cache line. So if someone has it modified and they have maybe different parts of the cache line modified than you're writing to. Like a cache, you have 64 bytes cache in a single cache line. Yes. If someone has, say, byte 3 of it modified and we're actually writing to byte 7, we care that their byte 3 gets written out. Yes, that's true. So how do we deal with that as far as cache lines? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, if, if we're writing the entire cache line, then we're okay. If we're writing some, anything less than the entire cache line, we've got to do, like you do on an SS, we've got to do a read, modify, write, right? We've got to read the current value, where reading the current value may mean telling whoever has it modified to find, right, to put it back. Okay. So for now, let's assume we're writing the entire cache line. We'd always would have to read first and then write. So how much time is it between you write to RAM and then everything else gets invalidated? Or is it first gets invalidated and then you write to RAM? Well, it first gets invalidated and you don't write to RAM. So there's no writing to RAM here. <laughs> oh, we're going to just write to yours. We're going to just write to our cache. Because I might be in a loop going through incrementing, a num you know, incrementing a, an address in a fast loop, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, or something. And so we don't want to be going to main memory for any of that. We're gonna just sit there hitting the cache. So you write to your so you write to your cache and then you keep telling everyone else that it's invalid. That they should invalidate that memory. That they should invalidate. Exactly. So what about the time in between? Like in between like you writing and then Well, hold on a second. I'm gonna back up a second. The first time we're gonna to go to a modified state. And as we'll see in a moment, the modified state actually gives us exclusive access. Um, or we assume we have exclusive access. So someone else is going to ask us if they want that value. Uh, if we do a find, someone says, you know, write out the contents of, of, of it, we don't have anything. And if they say invalidate, we do, don't, need it, don't do anything. If we're shared, so it's in a shared state. That is, we read it once from memory. and memory still has that same value. No one else has a newer value. Then if we want to read, we just read from it. If we want to write, we've again, just like it was invalid, we have to make sure we're the only modified state will invalidate everyone else. And if we're invalid, so on an invalidate, we've got to switch from shared mode to invalid mode. So you write to your cache, you said to modify, you invalidate everyone else, and then if another CPU tries to read that same address from the cache, it's now invalid, and since it's invalidated, they would have to go to RAM. But at, would, at that point, would the modified one and the original one have already updated what's in RAM, or? So here's what happens on an invalid. Yeah. When we do a read and we do a find, we wait for the find to finish so that whoever had it modified will have gotten a chance to write it to memory. Oh, okay, okay that's, that's that key right. there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It seems kind of inefficient if we have the thing cached in one CPU and now we need it in another one. We're saying write it to memory and then read it back from memory into the other one. There are certainly other protocols that would just directly have direct inner CPU where, they, where it could be moved. Okay, and then on modified, yeah. True. Yeah. Everything and set yourself to modify, but then when you are trying to read, 
and in the invalid state, and it says find. So does the find then mean that we're going to go through the cores and find the cache with the modified state? Because it's not written it back to me. So I guess I'm asking, what is the find specifically doing? Is it Actually, let's just look right here. Find doesn't do anything if you're invalid, doesn't do anything if you're shared, and let's look at what it does right here. What it does in modified is you write your cache value to main memory and then set yourself to shared. So, and on read and write, you do nothing, which is kind of nice. What that means is if you are the one who has got this modify bit set for a cache line, you can read and write it at will without having to do any communication with anyone else and without having to go into main memory. But where this hurts is if you've got something ping-ponging with modify access back and forth. Yeah. So like, let's say I do a find and someone else has an M, like a modify on that uh, address. Do I, like, does it then mean that um, I have to wait for some communication back from them to say that they finished just like writing to main memory and then something? Yeah, you can't do any. Either you're going to directly get information back from them that says what the new cache value is, or you're going to get some. There, you have to ensure that that find is finished before you go to memory. I mean, you're going to wait until the memory bus is free, which is going to necessarily be after they've finished writing. It's a shared as long as when you do your find that they grab the memory bus before you look, then you're yeah. okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's play. Cash. <laughs> All right. So we have one, two. Let's do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We have an eight CPU system. All right. So that means we should have two or three people per CPU. So this is number seven, number six, number five, number four, three, two, one, and zero. All right? This is self-assignment to CPUs. Go. All right, everybody read, oh, and I am main memory. Okay. <laughs> so everybody read one, two, three, four. <laughs> what? How did you get that information? You all would need to yell fines, but you have to raise your hands. Okay, and then someone go, let's say. Okay. Find one, two, three, four. Find one, two, three, four. Find one, two, three, four. Okay, you guys can keep going though, quietly. Wait, where are you going to get that from? Hello. We like one, two, three, four. Hello. Hello. No, 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 not find one, two, three, four. That was find one, two, three, four. Now you go to the bus, and I say hello. No, you already did that. Okay. Now what would you like to do? You come back to me when you know. Hello. Hello. No, I mean that's the context. Yeah. Hello. What's what is what? What is one two three four? Oh, hello. Okay. <laughs> Can you be with Giselle so we have at least two people? All right. So we are, you're currently, everything's invalid, right? So you're doing a read. 
from an invalid state. So you need to do a find. So do a find to everyone. Just say, say find. Find one, two, three, four. Find. We happen to know no one has it. Okay, and then what are you going to do? I'm main memory. Hello. Okay. Where? <laughs> Just anywhere? Oh, hello. Okay. All right. Now, CPU, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, number three. Uh, change it to goodbye. Change one, two, three, four to goodbye. <laughs> okay, and everyone read five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, everyone ignores that. Okay. Yeah, it's three. <laughs> and if anyone else wants to know, five, six, seven, eight from RAM is three. Okay, hold on a second. Hold on. Okay, you're invalidated. You're invalidated. You're invalidated. You're modified. You're invalidated. Okay, guys, can you uh, add an exclamation point to the end of your cache line? I w okay, well, let's change it. It's a problem. Uh, make it uppercase. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, and make the second one uppercase, too. All right, and can you guys read one, two, three, four? Hold on, what happened to five, six, seven, eight? Oh, only the, only no, everyone's reading five, six, seven, eight. Ooh, that <laughs> 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 okay. Um, I want you to read one, two, three, four. Now, only one person, at most, should, should react to that. What specifically goodbye? OK. And what does a goodbye look like? Capital G, capital O, goodbye? OK. All right. What's goodbye? It's goodbye with a capital G and a capital O. It's goodbye with a capital G and capital O. All right, and now change it so it's uh, uppercase Y at the end, or uppercase E at the end. Yeah, I am. Okay. Whoa, what'd you just do? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Why is it shared? Okay, you did the read. Fair enough, and you made yours be shared. Okay, so so far it's only two shared, and the other guy, the guys that you don't have in your cache, because no reason to put it in your cache until you actually need it, right? And now change the E to a capital E. Uh, wait. Before you do that. Okay. All right. And you guys, can you just, without even looking, write to one, two, three, four, and write done. I don't know. Do we have a protocol written down that tells us what to do? <laughs> I'm main memory. I don't know why you're asking me. <laughs> Guys, what about your capital E? What happened? She's just making it be trashed. That careful work you did. Because you're changing that, in, right? She, they said invalidate one, two, three, four. And you unhappily look and say, I have this modified stuff that I carefully created, and I have to just throw it away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you do. Okay. 
<laughs> exactly. So. Okay. And probably at some point there's some way to flush all the caches when we're shutting down or something like that, which would be someone outside saying, what? Find all, maybe, right? <laughs> so that if the NSA wants to quickly throw our device into liquid nitrogen and then come through and figure out what's in RAM, yeah, exactly. Uh, because we're writing the contents of our virtual memory to disk so that we can do a fast reboot. Bits of virtual memory, which is then going to involve. So, okay. <laughs> Questions about the protocol? All right. One, yeah, you can sit down because we were, the last thing that was written was done. Yes. Exactly. It became a validated, they lost it. And if they, ri if they tried to read again, they'd make, I have this one do a find, and they'd read now the done. So, which makes sense, right? Basically, you know, if you've got two writers, the last writer wins. So when you were telling them to change, like, the debug, the capital G, it wasn't like main memory telling them. It was like you No, I, that's true. I should have used a different voice. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like them. It was, it was the CPU. It was actually, yeah. It, they're the cache line, right? They're the cache, and so it's the CPU above them that's actually telling them so to do stuff. That, between the time that they change that and someone else just does a file, they have to wait until they write to you to main memory? Does that make sense? If someone does a find, they have to write to write main memory immediately. Yeah. Until someone does a find, it's no one else is interested in this. So, so they can go ahead at full speed. Okay. Uh, so some of the invariants, you can't have two that are modified. You can't have two where one is modified and one is shared. You can have as many shared as you want, but only one modified. Um, and what does this speed up a lot? Multiple reads of the same cache line for different cores. That works very quickly, right? Because they just turn into the shared state and they're all then just reading this cache memory. Or one core that's repeatedly writing to a cache line also works well. What doesn't work well is other combinations, like um, multiple cores trying to write the same location, read and write the same location. Yeah, yeah writing's not so bad. So reading and writing the same location uh, is bad. Even this ping-ponging back and forth even if you're just writing, can still be expensive, right? Where, because you're having to do a, no, if I just write, I'm fine. Yeah, if I'm just writing, I'm fine. I, yeah, I still am sending out an invalidate, but I don't have to wait for that invalidate. Okay. So why do we care about this? Because this is going to tell us what's going wrong with these locks. Uh, other CPUs, there's more complex state machines, so it's not just uh, modified and shared um, and invalid. You can also have exclusive or owner. Okay. And the way CPUs are connected together is not necessarily via just a bus. So we have some fast communication between CPUs that are on the same die, right? when you have a multi-CPU chip, and there are other connections uh, between dies. We also have cache directories commonly because we don't want to say find to everybody. We really want to know who has a particular cache line and then talk to them. So commonly what happens is CPUs have ranges of addresses that they're responsible for. And so if anyone wants to know about anything in this range, I'm the owner of a particular CPU and they know to come to me and ask me, and I will then go ahead and send it, and, and send it off to whoever really has it. Okay. So that um, everyone doesn't have to deal with it all. Uh, why do we still have locks? Because 
Locks and cash are totally different things. Lock, caches don't allow us to have critical sections. Right? We still need locks for critical sections in case we have a read, modify, write, or in case we have a data structure that we're in the middle of updating and we want everyone else to see it after it's all done. Okay? So that's why we have likes, locks. We have the exchange instruction. right? So the exchange basically says exchange. Uh, roughly, it's a memory address. And I think you can also use a register here. Right? So it will return you the value at this memory address and write and, and swap these values. So it won't return it. It will take what's in the register, put it in the memory address, take what's in the memory address, put it in the register. Okay. Uh, and this is faster than if you do two memory addresses because then you've got to possibly be doing uh, two memory accesses. Yeah. Why don't we have like atomic primitives that are built off of this whole thing of no like we already if we already have this cache which knows like do we have exclusive access to this? Has someone else modified it since we last touched it? Why isn't that used to build better, I guess, kind of atomic primitives? I don't know that they're necessarily any better. Maybe so I think it's more a matter of having our using our primitives in a way that plays well with this information, this, this. Okay. But if you want to come up with something, maybe there is some, I mean, some way to do you it. You just have like a store so long as no one else has modified the cache line. And then, but then you don't yeah. really have an atomic array yeah. as much as the ability to see if someone else messed with it, which doesn't yeah. get put in a repo loop and it's atomic. But then you just wait until someone hasn't messed with your stuff, and then it's an atomic operation. <laughs> so, um, there are other atomic operations we're going to see compare and swap later. Um, so, and basically, what happens is the way we described that just a little bit. It it defers uh, any find or invalidate. So basically, it puts us in a modified state. We do the read and write. And we keep going. Okay. So it's not that we lock out the bus in order for this to work, because we know we get it in modify state, and now we're just in our cache, and we could just manipulate it in our cache. Okay. So here's the problem, and this is the problem with our non-scaling locks: is how long does it take to lock? And how long does it take, more importantly really, let's say we don't care how long it takes to lock. If, remember our diagram over here, where I said we had a lot of CPUs and we have this critical section. And so normally when you come into here, it's going to take you some time to acquire this lock. I mean, sorry, you will need to acquire the lock because, of course you need to acquire the lock to get in the critical section. You'll need to wait before you acquire the lock because there's something already <laughs> running this, and there may even be people waiting. How long it takes you to acquire that lock doesn't really matter that much. You're wasted anyway, right? You're not doing useful work. You're sitting here waiting for this lock. But it's here that we care about what happens at the unlock. How long does it take for us to move from the CPU that had this lock to the next CPU that gets to start. Okay, what is the overhead? And if the overhead is order one, that's a good thing. But if the overhead is order n, where n is the number of CPUs, that's a bad thing. And that's basically what's happening with these non-scalable locks, is that the transfer from, so this is CPU one, lock, Acquire, lock, release. And then we have conceptually, let's do it this way. We have now this guy does a lock acquire. <coughs> so this is CPU2. And then Right? We're just wait. 
wait until this guy releases. The question is, from this release to when this actually gets the lock, what's that time take? That's the handoff time from CPU 1 to CPU 2. Okay. If we have 48 CPUs, but only two are waiting on this lock, this will be a quick handoff. The problem is, does this handoff get longer and longer as there are more and more CPUs waiting? That's the, um, I was going to say, non, the, the linearity, the, the handoff cost. So now we need to look and see how our locks actually implemented and how do these interfere, uh, interact with the cache lines. So this is a test and set spin lock. where we are, have a struct that just has a value saying whether it's locked or not, and we're all trying to do this. So let's look at what happens here on a So we're repeatedly doing this exchange. Okay? The waiters are doing this exchange. Do we care about that? No. They're, they cannot be doing anything useful anyway until they get the lock. So if they're sitting there doing this exchange, fine. Who cares? But if that slows down the lock holder, that's bad. It can't slow down the lock holder while it's in the middle of its critical section. But if it slows it down in its release, having these other guys doing these exchange calls, that's what will be bad. So what happens? The release guy is trying to write a zero to locked. Okay. We know it's going to have to go into modify state to do that, right? Either from the shared state or from the invalid state. True. Okay. While it's in the middle of the lock, it can't. But it can at the time the lock gets released. So if we look here at the release, where we're trying to execute a single line of code, L locked equals zero, right? A single instruction, prob probably. Can those spinning cores slow this down? And the answer is, yes, they can, even though it's a single instruction that's executing. And let's look at why. So we've got our cache line here in CPU number 7. And I'm going to put the address is address of locked. OK? And I'm going to say it's invalid. So this is the lock holder. All right. And we've got number six over here. And it's doing an exchange. An exchange of locked with one. Okay. So this is the same address. And since this guy, so since this is the lock holder, we know in main memory what's the value of locked? It's one, because it's locked. Okay? So this guy doesn't exchange. So he's gonna put one in the locked and return basically locked. So it writes a 1 into locked. It switches to modify, right, from invalidate. So it does a find. It goes to modify. It writes a 1 here. It gets its old value, which is 1. And then it writes a 1. 
And it's going to be busy trying to do that as it goes. And every other CPU is going to be trying to do the same thing. So when this CPU runs, number five, it's going to try to do an exchange with locked. So it's going to say, OK, I'm going to do an exchange. First thing I'm going to do is do a find. right? Because I'm currently invalid, so I'm going to do a find. This guy is going to write his one out. This guy is going to read the one in, swap it with this one, and switch this to modify. So all of the waiting cores are going to be busy handing off who has modify privilege. OK? I was going to say, doesn't that slow down the lock code? Because that like, makes the shared bus uh, do a bunch of useless work. It's true. That makes a, that's an interesting point. It makes the shared bus. So, so we would want to actually have this optimization where when I do a find, I don't actually go over the bus. And it directs, does a direct communication to the CPU and says, give me the contents of the cache line. So assuming we had that, it's not going to slow down the lock holder until the lock holder says lock equals 0. In order to do this, it needs to get M access, right? So it's invalid. All the rest of you guys are CPUs. And you're all busy exchanging as fast as you can and fighting it out. And if we looked, if we had like a token, do we have a token? If we had a token, you've got the M bit, and then all of a sudden someone else asked for it. And then someone else, right? And it's going around and around. Now, here I go. I am done with my critical section. I say locked equals 0. Everyone raise your hand who wants the token. OK? I want it too. And let's say this is fair so that I don't have to wait forever, right? But everyone who was ahead of me waiting gets it first. So go ahead. Just put your hand down when you're done. At zero for two, Jake. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> now I write a zero. And then, oh, you wanted it? And then you. Yeah, so I'm going to do modify. I write a zero. And now you happen to be the next one. And what do you do? First, you. Uh, I oh, I will write this to main memory or give it directly to you. OK. But how long did I have to wait? We don't care about you, <laughs> right? Or any of the rest of you, because you were doing useless stuff anyway, right? But I got slowed down, order in time, waiting for you guys in order to be able to release the lock. That's the problem. So if we want to have n CPUs work our way through the critical section, each one is going to take order n time to do the handoff, which is going to take order n squared. <coughs> yeah. Couldn't that be trivially fixed by just inserting a loop where we first just try reading it and only try writing to it if we previously read that it would be a 0? So that way, shares would, cores would have it in the shared state instead? Well, with a test and set. Um, so you're saying test and then test and set only if the first test succeeded. Oh, I see. Yeah, you could, I mean, you could try, well, let's see. Was the adversity of the operation that you could get that it is a clear and then someone else takes it? I mean, well, that could certainly happen, which is why you still would need to do the atomic. But, yeah. But the, the only point, like, like the test and set still happens still fail. The only difference is that way is that way cores generally keep getting shared instead of modified because they're not writing to it unless they think it might be useful. And then if it's in shared, you can just grab it by sending out and invalidate everything. So basically, let me see if I understand. You look for a zero. So first we read it. 
Yes. And then if we see a zero, then we try, then we try doing yeah. that. Yeah. There's, there's the, so when we get a zero, we get what's called the thundering herd, right? Which is all of you would see a zero, and you're all jumping to do the exchange, right? Uh, but it actually doesn't matter that much. Or does it? So who gets there is the question. But if one of them can get there, and if it's still cheap to acquire the lock, then it's fine. So that could, the first gets, gets the lock, and then someone yeah. else doesn't get the lock, so it's yeah. terrible. Well, the That's important true. thing is that the unlock doesn't get slowed down, because yeah. nobody tries to There's two it. things we want. We want to make sure that the um, releasing the, the total handoff from the time I am starting the release to until, until you have successfully acquired uh, doesn't get slowed down. So even if my part is fast, if your part suddenly turns slow, that would be bad. All right. Go ahead. The way we dealt with multiple modify is the first thing you do when you are modifying. So let me back. If you are going to go to modify mode, you send out either a find or an invalidate. And in either case, no one else will be in the, in the M mode. Okay. The ticket, well, one thing, by the way, about the um, test and set lock that we were just doing is I kind of showed everyone who had their hands up. There's no order, though. It's like whoever happens to get that successfully complete that exchange first gets it. So Linux has had added, and though they no longer use, these ticket locks, um, which provide some fairness. So the idea is first come, first serve. Okay. So basically, it's, it's, it's just like I went to Costco uh, to the glasses department. And you go up and they take a number, right? And then you wait for them to call the number, exactly like that. So we know the current ticket, and we know the next ticket to be, to be uh, generated. So when you're trying to acquire, you go ahead and find the value of the next ticket. Atomically, right? So this is an atomic instruction that will get the current value and increment. The order I'm not sure of. So it either returns it after the increment or before the increment. It hardly matters, as long as it's one or the other. And then you just wait until your ticket is up. Notice we're just reading. That's nice, right? Because if we're just reading, what state are we in? in the cache line. Shares. Shared. So we've got someone, the, the lock holder, which is going to be in the shared state as well, I believe. And the Ticket, so let's see, look at what the ticket value is. Actually, we're interested now in uh, next ticket. No, current ticket. So let's say the current ticket, we're now serving customer 99. Okay? And all these guys have shared 99. All right. So now what happens? The atomic increment. We do a find message. OK? So let's look a second for here. That's not expensive. The spinning, not expensive. But what happens on the release? So we're trying to increment the current ticket. So we read the ticket. We find it in our cache. We write the ticket. What happens? What do we have to do on a write if we're in shared mode? Invalidate. So we're going to send this guy an invalidate. In fact, we'll broadcast the invalidate, right? 
here, and everyone else. And meanwhile, we go ahead and write a 100. And we're in modified mode, and we're done. So we get to go on our merry way. So the handoff, are we done with the handoff? We're not done with the handoff because no one else has started yet. Okay. So this guy's trying to read. Oh, sorry. I didn't invalidate. I, I. Now this one tries to read. And what happens? So it's an invalid state on a read we. Send out a find. So we're going to send out a find to everyone. And so there's one find. And this guy in response is going to write this 100 to here, right? And now this guy is going to read 100 in the shared state. And that's great. Every core is going to do this that's waiting. Is that one shared now too? This one is actually shared now too. You're right. Good. So if we look at the messages that need to be sent, we're going to have however many cores are waiting, finds. Okay? Which is order n finds. And so this still is costly. Okay. Why do we do why do all the CPUs need the current ticket? Why do all the CPUs need the current ticket? Because they're all waiting. They're all, they're all spinning right here. Oh, so this is still a spin lock. Yeah, there's it's still a spin lock. Yeah. All these all these are gonna be spin locks. The question is, is it gonna be scalable or not scalable? The lock holder doesn't have to do anything. What we are actually looking at, and I should point out, so this is what the, what we're counting is the messages that need to be sent. Okay? So the message that need to be sent is some indication of cost. So this guy can, as soon as he doesn't write, go on the way. But we've got this large number of finds that has to happen. And why is that slowing us down right here? Hold on a second. Oh, that is exactly it. I'm sorry. So if this guy, the first one that read this, was yeah, was ready to go, and this was him, he's good. But if we have 20 waiters, on average, the 10th one that reads it is going to be the find that it's, its ticket. So this guy's going to read, and he says, oh, I'm 103, damn. And this guy reads, and, it, right? and he reads shared 100. And he says, no, I'm 116. And we keep going and keep going until someone finally looks and says, oh, that's me. But how long do they have to wait? On average, half the number of waiters that were there. Thank, thank you for that. Right. So the problem is we're using the same cache line for everybody. Seems like you could fix that by having like a two-stage wake-up process. So you have only one wait, one that's waiting to actually go, and then everyone else is waiting to get ready to be the next one. It seems like it. I'll agree with that. Um, so that's the collapse. We're 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 back at the collapse now. One question is, so. On this particular example, the critical section takes 7% of the time. Okay? So if the critical section takes 7% of the time, you would expect that we should be able to get 100 over 7%, right? Which is around what? 13, 14, 791, 14. But our collapse happens much earlier than that, right? Our collapse happens at 9. Why does that happen? 
because we have effectively extended the length of our critical section. We have the critical section right here, which is in fact 7% of the time, right? So this takes, you know, seven units, and this takes a total of 100 units. But by making the handoff bigger, we have the cost of the handoff that we have to include as well. And so since the handoff has get, gotten bigger, our total amount of time in this critical section has gone from, let's say, 7% to, I would say, around like 11%, 11 exactly. Okay. And so that's one of the contributions this paper had is, is coming up with this uh, model of what's going on. And then, you know, once you have a slower handoff time, the critical section is larger, we have more waiters happening, more waiters means our handoff time is longer, so it's, uh, it's just not good. Um, so, for example, we acquire, we do just a quick increment and we release. If no one else is waiting, it's 40 cycles. If some other core was using the lock last time, it would cost us 100 cycles. And if there's dozens of cores, it can take thousands of cycles, right? It's unbounded as you have many, many cores. So we want order one message release time, that many messages that are sent. Uh, that many messages that are sent before the next thread gets to start running. So have each course been on a different cache line? So here's an example, MCS locks, uh, Mellor Crumney and Scott, so two authors, they named it after themselves. Uh, and then there are other locks that are three, three, two or three letters and they're named after their authors too. So the idea is we have a Q node and a Q node we basically have a Q <coughs> right, of locks. So this might be CPU 3, it's looking at this one, and CPU 5 is looking at this one, and CPU 7 is looking at this one. Okay. So the owner of the lock, the lock holder, is, has, is at the head of the list. The next guy in line is next in the list, the next guy in line is next in the list, and so on. And everyone is spinning on their own value. So five is spinning on this value, and three is spinning on this value. And therefore, they're separate cache lines, and there's no problem. And so on a release, this guy will update this value. It updates this value. No one else is in contention for this cache line. This guy reads the value, goes on his way. One complication is the implementation. The API is different. So acquire doesn't just take a lock anymore. It takes a lock and a Q node. Okay. And the release takes a lock and a Q node. We can see here on the release, so actually let's look at the release. In the lock, if we look at what the next value is, we'll do a swap, basically, where uh, we'll swap the, the head of the list to point to, I'm sorry, the tail of the list. And we then set the locked of the next to false. Okay. Um, this shows basically five different kinds of locks. Guess which one is the non scalable lock? <laughs> right? It's the one that goes down and to the right. All the rest of them are scalable, they have different performance. Uh, the K42 lock is based on the MCS lock except right, in the MCS lock, you explicitly have this Q node. In the K42 lock, you declare a Q node as a local variable in acquire. 
So there's still a linked list of Q nodes, but they happen to be local on the stack of each CPU. People, and the nice part about them is you have the same API. The reason it's not used is because this wasn't published in a uh, journal article. This was published in a US patent. So, uh, from IBM. Questions? All right. Um, your questions for me, I will talk about on Wednesday.